Welcome to the Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health Podcast, where we talk about the clinical and practical issues that face those working in the mental health industry. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health. My name is Erin Mullineau Bailey. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Cognitive Behavior Institute, and my co-host, Dr. Kevin Caridad, who is the CEO and owner of Cognitive Behavior Institute. On this week's episode, we have a very special guest, Representative Daphna Michelson Janae of Colorado House District 30. Representative Michelson Janae is in her third term as a Colorado State Representative and serves on three committees. She is a member of the Education Committee and chair of both the Legislative Audit Committee and the Public and Behavioral Health and Human Services Committee. Representative Michelson Janae's legislative work primarily focuses on mental and behavioral health healthcare access, especially as it pertains to youth. So Representative, thank you so much for being here with us today. We are very excited to have you and uh, spend some time with us and our listeners today talking about mental health wellness exams and other mental health legislation. So thank you so much for taking the time. Absolutely. Can you tell us and our listeners, have you always wanted to be in politics or what has led you to public office? Uh, I did not always want to be in politics, but I always wanted to be involved in my community. So from the time I was 14 years old, I sat on uh, boards and volunteered and um, was very, very actively engaged in my community. Um, And I also live by a value that is, I will not complain about a problem unless I'm willing to work on the solution. So Ultimately, that's what led me from nonprofit to nonprofit to nonprofit to nonprofit to be fixing, solving problems, because I saw nonprofits as sort of the key to problem solving and community. Um, And then I struggled a great deal with getting my son the help he needed in school. Um, He needed an appropriate IEP, um, and he he never was able to get an appropriate IEP. Um, And at the same time, as I was trying to help my son, I was volunteering in two of our juvenile correctional facilities. And I realized that the boys um, that I was working with were very much like my son, uh, likely twice exceptional, so exceptionally gifted with an exceptional learning disability and not getting the help that they need. And here I am, um, uh, a knowledgeable, connected mom with all of the information at my hand and more. I had a I I had more access than most people, and I couldn't get my son an IEP who was fighting for these kids. And um, shortly thereafter, my son attempted suicide at school when he was nine years old. And I realized that, you know, we have a, a, a very, very serious problem on our hands and ultimately realized the decision makers were not helping my child. So I needed to become the decision maker and to become the decision maker was to become a lawmaker. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And before we jump in all about mental health, we also understand that you have published two books. Can you just tell us a little bit about those before we get started? Sure. My first book is called, it takes a little crazy to make a difference. And ultimately it is about um, my travels in 2009. I traveled to all 50 States one state each week to find and share stories of ordinary people solving problems in their communities. So really based on that, you know, when I was 14 kind of thing, who else was out there solving problems? And in 2009, our economy collapsed, kind of, you know, different cause, but similar to now. And I thought if I could share stories of everyday ordinary people changing the way that their community um, worked and succeeded and thrived, that I could help lift up the depression that I was seeing all over the place. Um, So that's my first book. And my second book, which I actually completed before my first book um, uh, is called Peanuts Legacy. Um, And it is the story about um, my pregnancy when I was 40 years old with my current husband and we desperately wanted a baby. And I was looking for blogs of how wonderful pregnancy was at 40 and I couldn't find any, they were all gloom and doom. And then I lost my baby. And um, so I was blogging about how wonderful it was and then 
then I lost my baby at 20 weeks. Um, and what was the process that we went through as a family? What did my husband go through? What did I go through? What did my children go through? And how did we, um, I, I, you don't ever recover, but how did we move forward as a family successfully and healthfully? So that's my second book, Peanuts Legacy. Well, thank you for sharing that with us. I'm sure, I mean, such an incredible loss and we're, we're very sorry for your loss, but um, I look forward to checking that out. Um, I'm sure it's a remarkable story and a lot of people out there who also may have experienced the type of loss that you have, I'm sure that can be very helpful to them. I hope so, that was the intention. Right. Absolutely. No, you have such a, a large diverse background in uh, solving problems. Uh, and you talk about the legislature and uh, being there and going into your third term, I believe. What do you think are some of the biggest barriers being on the side of the legislature uh, that oftentimes maybe everyday people don't understand the barriers or the limitations that are there? So if you could give us some perspective from that view, that would be helpful, uh, specifically about mental health. Um, g give me more. What do you mean by barriers? So oftentimes... Uh, I hear social workers, being a social worker ourselves, trying to pass a bill here like in Pennsylvania for uh, a very long time for telehealth laws. Uh, but it seems to get shot down every year. And I'm like, it seems like it's it's a no-brainer, uh, particularly this year has shown it to be very valid, our, our, but nothing still has been passed. So this is in Pennsylvania. I'm wondering, similar, you know, what, what are the things that get in the way that people should know about? Well, first of all, I recommend you move to Colorado. We did pass really wonderful telehealth laws. Um, and uh, we also are a member of SIPACT, which was uh, the interstate compact uh, to be able to work across state lines. So you, you're, you're, the state that you're in and the composition of the legislature really determines um, how fortunate you're going to be on the mental health arena. And we always say mental health should not be political, but unfortunately mental health, like everything else, is political. And um, some of the laws that, that I have worked on to bring forward, um, uh, the, the members across the aisle were very concerned that um, by giving youth more access to mental health care that we're breaking up the family unit, that we're trying to take their kids away. Um, uh, my bill was called a no-knock raid. It had nothing to do with coming to people's houses. Um, so, you know, there's there's really whatever the spin of the um, party against mental health treatment, um, that's what you're fighting against and, and understanding what the makeup of your legislature is. And Pennsylvania, you've got a tough legislature um, for mental health. You've got a tough le legislature for COVID. My mom's in Pittsburgh. She is um, oh, she's, she's a senior citizen with multi, multi um, uh, physical health concerns, and she can't get a COVID vaccine to save her life. And here we are in Colorado and we just opened up to age 50 today, which includes my husband. So it, everything unfortunately is political and determined by the political composition of your body. So it's worth knowing it. Um, you can change people's minds, but you must be engaged and understand what you're dealing with. What do you think are the, the strings to pull or the leverage that works best you think, at least from your experience? Um, you know, I, it really depends. You've got to know your legislators. So the, the first thing that matters most, be a constituent, be a voting constituent or be a child constituent with parents who vote. Um, so reach out to your elected representative, make sure they know and you know that they have seen your communication. Email is acceptable, telephone is acceptable. Um, many legislators have text available on their websites. Um, so communicate in the way that you feel is appropriate. Make sure you're aware of the pieces of legislation that are coming before the legislature and don't just assume because some group told you, well, this bill is seeking to turn all children gay. And I, I was accused of that at one point. No, read the bill, know what's in the legislation. And yes, maybe there are things you don't agree with in the legislation and certainly tell your legislator, but if there are things that you do agree with or if you have suggestions for how to change those things you don't agree with, it is, is your job to be an active and engaged citizen if you really wanna move mental health forward in your community. 
You have a wonderful goal, I'll call it, of getting Colorado to be the first state to require insurance companies that they cover annual mental health wellness exams at no cost to their consumers. Can you tell us more about that and also how that would impact your residents who are living in Colorado? Absolutely. Um, Colorado, unfortunately, um, depending on how you look at it, we're the bottom of the list or the top of the list for suicides. Um, and it is a devastating place to be as a society. And my goal is to get, I always say I want to get two miles ahead of suicidality, because if we can get well before suicidality, we may never get to suicidality. We might be able to actually manage a mental health concern before it becomes a crisis. Right now, our system is set up like this. Let's say, um, uh, let's say you go, Kevin, to the doctor, and the doctor says, Kevin, you got some high blood pressure going on. Why don't you give me a call when you have a heart attack? That's our mental health care system. Would we ever in a million years go back to a doctor that said, why don't you wait until you have a heart attack? And right now we're asking people in their moment of attack to be able to select a mental health care professional and to get treatment and help that they need that they should have had miles and miles down the road. And meanwhile, in 2008, the federal government passed a parity law. And if you look up the word parity, it literally means equal. So in theory, when you have a insurance benefit that is a physical health benefit, you should have equivalent benefits for mental health. Now, there is a lot of fine print in parity, but when I read parity on the surface, I'm saying I see in Colorado, and again, every state is different. In Colorado, most of our physicians offer a free physical every year. 45 to 60 minutes with a qualified physician. That is not true in every state, by the way. And parity only says you need to have a screening, but it says where a physical benefit is available, an equivalent mental health benefit should be available. So what's an equivalent to a physical? How about a mental health physical? If we understand the way we understand how to take care of our bodies to take care of our minds, we can change the entire landscape. Let me give you a little example. In 2018 was the Spanish flu pandemic. In Colorado at the time, we had about 300 physicians. You did not go to the doctor unless you were rich or dying. And many, many people died from the, the Spanish flu. Two years later in 2020, across the country, Insurance companies came up with the idea for an annual physical. One, bring some money in the door. Two, get people to understand how to take care of their bodies and build a relationship with a physician so they're not waiting till they're dying to figure out how to scrape the money together to get an appointment. And they build a bond and a relationship with somebody who's an expert in body systems. Well, here we are 100 years and another global pandemic later. And the subsequent underlying pandemic that we have going along with COVID is depression, anxiety, and suicidality. It's at the highest rates we've ever seen in Colorado, and I know that it's true around the country as well. And if we are able to connect people with a qualified mental health care provider, and to me, I think that's a social worker, right? Your, 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 your base level to understand your, your mind and how your mind functions and et cetera, to be able to work with a social worker from the time you're in utero. So pregnant mom, the same time she picks out a pediatrician, she picks out a primary mental health care provider and starts learning how to nurture her, her child, how to provide safe social and emotional growing spaces for her child. And the child continues to go every year, just like they go for their physical, for their mental health evaluation and their mental health uh, exam, it's not just an evaluation, um, so that they can learn what to expect. You're going into middle school, all of your emotions are gonna come in. You're gonna start feeling like your brain is melting. Here are some things that you could do when that happens. Here's how to reach out and here's how to identify when feeling blue turns into feeling depression. And here's how to identify when you need to have help. 
And maybe in midlife, you're going through a divorce. You get to learn how to handle all of those emotions that you're going to go through to be able to continue to go to work. One of the most significant costs to um, working America are mental health days. People that cannot come to work because they are too depressed. It's one of the biggest cost impacts on society. We can change that. And we can change that through an annual mental health wellness exam. No, I think that's a great idea. I mean, clearly there's literature supporting that when behavioral health issues are addressed, the total medical costs go down. Which So something medically must be happening in a positive way. And so it would make sense for insurance companies to bring that cost down. So uh, I hope you continue to be the spearhead of this and, uh, and get the country going in, in that right direction. <laughs> Working hard. <laughs> Wonderful. And I, I think it's also important to, to point out, and could you maybe share a little bit with us and our listeners about how the legislation, if it were to pass in a state like Colorado, could uh, and actually, in fact, catapult some other states if it's somehow borrowed or written into other state law, if you guys become the leader in this? Absolutely. So first of all, um, two other states have already picked up my legislation, Washington State and Kentucky. Um, Neither of them have passed it to my knowledge and, and they have shorter legislative sessions and I, I didn't hear that it passed in Kentucky or Washington yet. Um, so that's already beginning to happen. And how that happens is legislators connect throughout the year. We haven't had any of our conferences, um, but we connect and we learn about model legislation from other states um, so that we can bring legislation throughout the country. And quite frankly, um, we can bring legislation throughout the country faster than Congress can get something passed. So it, it behooves all of us to pay attention to what's going on in every state, and we do. We agree. That's why you're here today. <laughs> Absolutely. Can okay. you talk about some other uh, legislation that you've been uh, you've been looking to implement, uh, uh, particularly K through 12? Yeah, well, the thing that I'm absolutely the most excited about right this very, very, very minute um, so this is a separate piece of legislation, but it's going to sound very similar. So remember, I'm trying to get the annual mental health wellness exams passed. But at the same time, we have all of these students who are going to be going back to school in the fall, where in Colorado, at least, we are on track that everyone should be vaccinated by that point, And we're going to expect them to go back to normal after a year of severe traumatic abnormal. And one of the roles that I serve is chair of the school safety interim committee. And we look at why do school, why does school violence happen? And most of the time it can be tied back to PTSD and stress and anxiety. So here we are about to put all these kids in a powder keg. What if we were able to give every school age child in Colorado a mental health exam and a warm handoff to a qualified mental health care provider, ideally in their insurance network for sustainability before school begins. It would be a game changer. Kids would come in already prepared to learn versus coming in with all the stress and anxiety and leaving it on the teachers and the school social, worker, school social workers and school psychologists and school counselors to figure it all out. That's way too much pressure on the school. And it's way too much pressure on the kids. And one of the things we hear from kids a lot, one in five children in Colorado will tell you they have no trusted adult. Isn't that the saddest thing you've ever heard in your life? Well, imagine if the entire community came together to figure out how to get every school age child and not just public school kids, every school, you are you a kid in Colorado? You qualify. Every, every kid in Colorado, access to this exam, and then furthermore, three free appointments with that professional. So for many kids, if, they're, if they have minor stress and anxiety um, about and trepidation about going to school, three appointments could be a huge game, cha game changer. For kids with more severe um, mental health concerns, this could be the trigger to getting them the help that they need so that severity does not continue to grow. I think it's going to change the landscape and I believe we're going to get it done. Well, that's awesome. Uh, mental health does seem to be a national security issue from my perspective, particularly over the last year. So thank you for the work that you do. Uh, I know you have a little bit of a, of a tight schedule. Uh, otherwise we could keep you on all day. 
<laughs> we certainly hope that you'll come back and keep us updated um, as to all of, of the bills that you're working on in the legislation, because this is just fascinating and it's a breath of fresh air and it's exactly what our country needs. So thank you for all your hard work. You're so welcome. And thank you also for being in the field and making sure that the mental health and wellness are a priority of all of our, of our, all of our community, all of our community members. <laughs> We thank you. Forward, we look forward to touching base with you again soon. And um, thank you so much for your time. And thank you to our listeners for tuning into this episode of The Barrier Breakdown. We hope you all stay safe, well, and healthy. Take care. Thank you for listening to The Barrier Breakdown, Disrupting Mental Health. Listeners can find all of our episodes on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Podbean. For more information and to learn about upcoming continuing education events, check out our website, cbicenterforeducation.com, our Facebook pages, Cognitive Behavior Institute and CBI Center for Education, as well as our Instagram at Cognitive Behavior Institute and our Twitter at CBI underscore Pittsburgh. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. We hope you'll tune in for another guest next week.